another one, you bastard. Brought to you by supporters who probably have better taste than this schmuck. <laughs>change over time. You listen to Kings of Leon for the first time and you think, huh, I don't really give a shit. Then years later you come across them again and you can't listen to it for two seconds without getting pissed off because it reminds you of your abusive father. The same is true of action figures. Beyond the honeymoon phase that sets in for a week or two after receiving one, as the years go by you may lose connections to certain releases or the opposite might happen. You might find you were too harsh on a figure and there's a lot more to like. So far this is the third second opinion video I've done, the third time in this sub-series where I've gone back to re-examine an older diagnosis. Given where Delving into the second review I ever released, I assume this would be a cut and dry case. 2016 Doctor Lockdown was, to say the least, a judgmental prick who refused to take into account budgetary constraints, overall release context, and desired outcome on the designer's part. What is a figure trying to do? Does it do it well? Is it a good toy in its own right? What was the financial position of whatever company at the time? It took a while for me to slowly learn these things, and as such I assume this new diagnosis will be a pretty easy one. I mean of course I would have been too harsh on Thrilling 30 Springer, right? The comparison has to be much closer than I initially implied. Well, to figure this out, greetings Cybertronians, I'm Dr. Lockdown, and today for the first time we're combining the Versus Review format with that of the Second Opinion sub-series. I've been staring at this all day, I still don't get it. Through this, today's diagnosis pits two triple changes against each other. Thrilling 30 Springer and Siege WFC S38 Springer. Now before we get into this, yes, these two toys have vastly different aesthetics. In fact, I go as far as saying out of all the Versus Reviews I've done on this channel, these two are the furthest from each other. And to preempt the, well I don't think you should be comparing apples and oranges, they're far too different comments, I can still judge these as toys. Which one has better engineering? Which one has better build quality? Which one doesn't fall over after lightly tapping it? Besides, I'm usually the minority of collectors with how I own multiple versions of the same character. Most people want one Optimus Prime, one Megatron, one Bumblebee, no Minerva because the only readily available one on the market kinda sucks. Please be good legacy version. Point is, people are probably only going to go for one of these, regardless of aesthetics. I can't say I agree with this assumption, since even though there's a clear winner here, these are both at least decent toys worthy of your purchase, for different reasons. But hey, it's a common practice. So to separate what the community perceives as the winners from the slightly less bombastic winners, even if I don't particularly agree with it, let's start off with the car mode since it's the more solid of the two alt modes. Gee, imagine starting off with the helicopter mode just to be different from every other reviewer. It's not like there's a reason everybody does it. Gee, that would be crazy. <laughs> so taking a look at the older fellow, damn, this is one sick car mode. Looking like a post-unapocalyptic version of Mad Max where everyone terraformed the earth back to its original state and painted up their cars nicely because the rust aesthetic clashed with everything, Thrilling 30 brings the Nick Roche charm right from the pages to physical plastic. Now compared to a lot of triple changes, this is a little messier. You can kind of tell this thing transforms due to the seam lines and weird edges, making this thing look a little less solid than what we're used to. But if memory serves me correct, this was the first proper attempt at a modern triple changer, or at least the first that was done well. Prior to such, people had to make do with the likes of Classics Astro Train and whatever the Unicron trilogy cooked up as a third moment. Although to be fair, Universe 2008 Octane was pretty f sweet. But the point is, it's a little rough around the edges aesthetics wise. Maybe build quality wise, but we'll get to that in a minute. But given the time it came out, I think we can cut it some slack. Besides, it was either this or Blitzwing. I think we can all tell who pulled it off better. The muscle car-esque front really does a good job of drawing your attention away from a lot of jank going on behind. It's a little segmented, but given that it has to turn into a helicopter, helicopter. I think I can cut it some slash. Wait, I wrote, I wrote slash in the script instead of slack. <laughs> what the f and besides, it forms a mean chassis for the meaty Tonka tires. I love that these are both pinned and painted too. Around Thrilling 30, they kind of started moving away from both of these attributes. Good to see these still clinging on. And thanks to these big ass hunks of plastic, he rolls pretty well, even with the weapon storage below. Speaking of, I love the way this works. 2016 Doctor Lockdown often had issues lining the whole thing up to avoid clearance issues, but I imagine I was just a f***ing idiot at the time. Either way, it's really clever. Speaking of weapon storage, the gun actually blends in really well on top. I suppose it's partially due to the mad. Max influence, but honestly, it's really commendable. They even molded the back panel like a little seat, or rather an oversized seat. This is pretty out of proportion, but hey, it's a neat little feature, uselessness aside. And taking it around the back, initially I was pretty harsh on the lack of paint, but looking at how everything works, it makes sense. Given everything jams into the knee modules, paint here would end up chipping like a mother f so leaving it blank was a smart choice. And hey, using the rear lights as pegs to lock everything together? Darn that smart. Thrilling 30 Springer is an absolute visual treat. Sadly, there isn't much in terms of paint accents as it's used mostly for colour correction, but with a few key points of interest, it's able to carry across the comic design near flawlessly or the price point anyway. As a display piece, it wins against the Siege version, hands down. But as a toy, 
Oh dear. This thing just doesn't hold together at all. I desperately wanted to be less harsh on this thing to invalidate my old reviews, since maybe I was too much of an asshole with that, but everything I said back in 2016 sadly still holds up. As a toy to play with, this pulls it off extremely poorly. The seat panel has nowhere to tab in at the back, and neither does the entire top panel of the car. Come on, mate, that should be the most important thing of the whole design. These can almost be ignored due to the cleverly disguised seam lines, though. The windows? Not so much. No matter what you do, these will never remain in place. The tolerances on the arm pieces are ever so slightly off, meaning there's too much torque pulling them away from the center. Then moving back to the feet, these also refuse to tab in. Once again, they aren't as frustrating as the windows, but come on, man. The design itself is hella solid, the tabs should be as well. And yes, I'm aware that I've lost a spoiler piece. I've spent weeks looking for it in preparation for this review, but alas, no dice. I know there's going to be that one snarky commenter who thinks that invalidates the entire video since the toy is incomplete, and to them I say, sure. Oh, keep telling yourself that. That's my fault though, I'm not going to fault the toy for that. I am going to criticize the lack of a locking mechanism though. Just a couple of bumps to keep these in place, the bare minimum, they couldn't even do that. Then taking it in the completely opposite direction, the shoulder sections barely stay in place as well. Yes, I get these have to transform, but did the connections have to be this loose? And Jesus Christ, this yellow paint is horrible, ignoring the color matching because, let's face it, it's really difficult to match yellow paint and plastic as is. It's still so thinly done. You can see the gunmetal bleeding from behind it, it looks ridiculously icky. This mode has a lot of fantastic bells and whistles. The source material is legendary, and from a sculpting perspective, they've absolutely nailed it. If given more time, they might have been able to iron out the kinks and make this one of the best car modes of its time, but as it stands, there's just no solid core. I want to love this mode, I do adore the way it looks, but as a play-based collector who obsesses over clever engineering and sheer chunkitude and build quality, I'm sorry, as far as the car mode is concerned, it's all style and no substance. Conversely, Siege W UFC S38 Springer is cohesive in his engineering, but not so much in the way he's designed, although at least it seems like that at first. Although there's a definitive line back to G1 Springer in its DNA, it's clear that the transformation itself has dictated how this car turns out. As such, the proportions aren't the best. Much like the G1 toy, the front is far wider than the back. But due to the updated engineering taking precedence over the look, it's been exaggerated. In some people's eyes, it might be considered to be a fault. Personally, I'm a little annoyed by the proportions, but it's pretty easy to get over. What I take issue with more is the giant's back panel. It looks a little better in helicopter mode, but here it feels hella out of place, especially with the minuscule cockpits. This thing really should have been bigger. I do adore the aqua plastic they've used here, and it pops way more than his IDW counterpart, but I reckon it should have been way wider. Even the G1 toy had it as such. Oh well, I guess it has to shove itself into the backpack, and given the kibble management, it's probably a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. So from its obvious stumbles, you'd think it would be clear that this thing transforms, right? Well, it's kind of a reversal of what we saw with the Thrilling 30 version. IDW Springer has a more cohesive design that should work, but ultimately fails due to poor tolerances. Whereas the Siege one should hypothetically look like a bunch of random pieces thrown together, but surprisingly ends up being a damn cohesive sci-fi vehicle. It looks closer to something out of the Star Wars prequel trilogy, sort of like one of those clone tanks that got turned into a Transformer, not like that, and was then given a Universe 2003 colour scheme. For all my complaints about the backpack, there's a clear downward sloping motif that carries from the sides of the roof to the cockpit to the front. It really helps tie this thing together, as does the concise colour layout. There aren't a billion colours on the legs back here, it's all the same same bluish grey, and the panels line up damn nicely. Might be a bit messier than the Thrilling 30 version, but at least it holds together. Moving around to the thighs, you'd expect them to stick out like a sore thumb, or I guess a sore thigh, but given all the clean and concise mechanical detail over the rest of the stuff, you never notice it. And hot damn, the arm integration is awesome. The way the panels fold out to form a nice and clean protrusion is a sight to behold. This part alone absolutely demolishes any engineering the Thrilling 30 version has going, and it's all brought together with some absolutely gorgeous tampergraphed battle damage. Now, I'm aware that many people really dislike War for Cybertron battle damage, and admittedly it has been a little inconsistent. Sometimes it's done fantastically, others it's done really poorly. Personally though, when it's done well, I really like it. And in this case, it's done exceptionally well. Yes, it's a bit grainy due to the digital paint techniques, but honestly, the way I see it, that just adds to the effect. Especially on the grey on the back, it just looks stunning. Not to say the rest of the paint isn't done well. The yellow is done fantastically too. They've chosen to do all the yellow in paint, so as to make sure it matches up flawlessly. It's a pretty risky decision, because we've seen what happens when yellow paint isn't applied properly. In spite of the hardest colour to apply though, they've done it amazingly here. No plastic bleed whatsoever, no small feats when you've got a pretty bold plastic colour underneath. It's also durable as f**k. 
which easily places it above the previous version. Although my copy has a bit of QC wonkiness at the back. Pre-chipped out of the box, I'd legit be pissed if it wasn't in a place that's easily obscured. The rest of the paint is pretty durable too, although out of the box chipping does seem to be a running theme with my copy. Still, that aside, the lime green colour matching is damn close too. And they even brought back the painted hubcaps, something far rarer in the time period this version was released. Well, they didn't paint the hubcaps, but rather the tyres themselves, akin to Studio Series Clunk of Bumblebee, but eh, same difference. But hey, the fact they were willing to go that far when not a lot of figures in Siege were afforded such luxury is really commendable. It's the little things like that that show this was a piece with both passion and finesse crammed in. Not for any specific design, mind you, but rather Transformers design in general. And that's the kind of key difference between these two. In video form, picking which of these is better in car mode can seem difficult. Their qualities are deceptive, because when putting up a computer screen as a barrier, Thrilling 30 Springer looks better, no doubt. However, in person, it's a whole other story. I can see the passion for Springer as a design and a character in the IDW counterparts. It's clear that the designer really cared about bringing this character to life, but as a toy, there are simply too many fumbles to give it the win. Meanwhile, at face value, Siege seems kinda boring. It's a G1 brick, who cares about that? It's only when you get closer and examine all the subtleties that the true brilliance is revealed. The mechanical detail is plentiful and mature. The paintwork outclasses the previous version in strength of application, richness in colour, and sheer amount. And beyond that, it's just a more solid piece. You can pick it up, shake it around, and nothing's gonna come loose. Can't say the same for the Thrilling 30 version, which honestly is a real shame. And sure, the weapon storage on the Siege version is kinda sh**, no getting around it. But is that really grounds for determining a winner? Even the build quality is staggeringly better, as although they share the same mass and volume overall, WFC S38's plastic is far sturdier. If you're going in for the car mode and have a high level of affinity for the IDW design, then buying the Thrilling 30 version is a perfectly valid option. But if you're looking for the categorically better of the two car modes, at least in my eyes, the devil is in the detail. Siege wins hands down here, although I kinda wish that wasn't the case. I admit, I'm biased as f I massively prefer the IDW design to the G1 version. With that said, I just get more from this brick here. It's a brick, sure, but there's so much hidden under the surface that really pushes the level of quality. But hey, that's only one mode. Such isn't indicative of the whole package, right? Well, let's see if things stick the course, or if they change drastically. Now, obviously, given that one of these follows the G1 design and one of them follows the RDW design, these are going to have completely different transformations. There's not a lot of the G1 DNA in the Thrilling 30 design, aside from the fact that it's a green and yellow car that turns into a helicopter. There are maybe a few similarities, like the arm modules moving back and the legs kind of folding inside out, but that's about it. But which transformation is better ultimately boils down to two things, how satisfying it is and how clear clever it is. Hypothetically, you'd think the Thrilling 30 version would be the more clever one, and uh, I guess it's almost there. A lot of good ideas on show, but you'll see the problem in a moment. You want to bring these sections out. They're supposed to be tabbed into the sides here, but they're not because the tabs don't work, oh joy. Rotate the spoiler sections around 180 degrees. Clip these together at the back. Bring these sections out. Don't untab it from the chest sections. You just want to bring the chest sections back like so. They won't go all the way, though, because the first thing you want to do is come here and pull these panels out. Oh, they're a bit difficult. And they're on sliding rails, my least favourite part of Transformers design. I hate sliding rails, I always have. It just seems like a loose and cheap way. Because eventually that's just going to wear down and become loose, but oh well, we have what we have. Anywho, you've now got these sections that rotate out like that. You've got tabs there and slots there, and these tab together, like so. Make sure the fists are in, because sometimes they wobble out and oh. It looks like the tab isn't very strong there, oh no. Come on, stay in your f place. Get in there. Now, on the windows, you've got the peg there and the slot there, and they just kind of peg together like so. And that's the sides of the helicopter done. Looking pretty f unfinished, if you ask me. Some clever ideas on show, but they just kind of gave up here. You bring this panel here, and it locks into place at the front there. Yes, it actually locks into place. Thank you. Bring this up a little bit, and these two are supposed to peg in together with that panel there, but the tolerances are f so it doesn't. So just kind of line that up there, and then bring these down a click so it's facing like that. And bring the spoilers like so to make stabilizers, or if you're kind of missing one there, that's fine too, because it falls off easily, yay. Landing gear pops out like that, and I really really, really love the way the knee spikes become the landing gear. That is something I will give it credit for. And finally, what you want to do is to get the sword that was stored underneath it and untab it like so. You then bring them down like that, bring the cross guard up, and then these lock into place. This right here is an amazing way to transform the swords into the blades. A brilliant system, probably the most clever thing on the entire transformation, which is kind of telling of the figure's quality in the end, but we'll get to that 
that later. Anywho, big ol' 5mm port in there, and we're done. Transformation has a lot of great ideas, but here's the problem. Things don't tab in very well. Like, let's look at this. Just kind of folds out like that. It doesn't feel like a finished transformation. It feels more like a fan work than an official product. I really want to say this is an amazing and super clever transformation, because it does clever things, but for a mainline transformer, even considering the quality of triple changes we'd gotten previously, it just isn't up to scratch. So, what is it, like three, four years difference between Thrilling 30 and Siege? Let's see how this fares in comparison. What you want to do is untab this section up like that. The really neat thing is that the feet are slotted into these little grooves here at the front here, but what you want to do is untab the legs from the little tabs there and the slots there. They're separate from the whole knee section there. And come on, mate focus. But anyway, these transform into their robot mode configuration out like that. Separate the legs like so, rotate around 180 degrees, untab these sections from here, and do the same with these inward sections. They rotate around 180 degrees. You then come to the hips and you'll notice there's two hinges in there. You want to use those hinges to pull everything down and together. This is why you want to rotate the thighs first so you don't get confused with anything because that way everything lines up properly all together like so. Even the kind of spiky sections form a nice stabilizer at the back there. You want to line these feet up along the insides like so because they'll fold into the legs later and to do that you need to pull the arms out of the way just so you've got enough clearance. Then these will actually lock into place. You'll notice there's a little hook there that hooks into the side there nice and sturdily. Doesn't seem sturdy, but it is. Maybe let's do the arms first before we focus on anything. You want to bring this section up. Tucked away on the inside, you've got the wing there. You pull it out on, ah, another sliding rail. I hate those. But no matter, you want to just push this back into there. And then the wing folds over and kind of just rests against there at a sort of slope. As much as I dislike the sliding rail mechanism, the way these arms fold out with these panels is really clever. Way more clever than anything the Thrilling 30 version is doing, if I'm being honest. So anyway, instead of pushing this up to the front, what you want to do is use the double hinge and push it towards the back. You'll notice there's a tab there and a slot hidden in there and the whole thing just nicely clicks together. It takes a bit of a while to line up, but eventually you get it like so. So you don't want it at the front like that, you want it towards the back using the double hinges and it should peg together. Oh, that one went much easier. Then to connect the whole thing together, you bring this section back down into the new tabs there. Oh, careful, nothing comes undone. And now let us assemble the blades by using two of the swords that we get and this little adapter piece. Very nice way to get things done. It's not as clever as the Thrilling 30 version, but it kind of works a bit better, I think. Like, this looks properly like Blades, whereas that one kind of almost there. This one, nice and spinny and looks amazing. Springer has a truly fun transformation with the way everything folds and unfolds and refolds. It's basically everything Astro Train is doing, but on a smaller scale. It might not seem like he's doing a lot, but in practice, he really is. So much like the other two modes, the way these function is incredibly deceptive. This is a G1 brick. This is an RDW design. This should be the more complex one. This should be the more simple one. But surprisingly, it's reversed. This is doing the unfinished kind of wibbly-wobbly transformation nonsense, whereas this is clean, concise, clever, complex, does everything super fluidly, yet does a lot. Another point to the G1 version, because that's how things are, I guess. I kind of wish it was the other way around, but I have to give credit where credit is due. Point to the Siege version, that's two for two so far. Sorry, IDW fans, I really don't want to do this. One inescapable fact is that every triple changer on the planet is going to have a dud mode. Universe Octane's robot mode, Times Return Sentinel Prime's train mode, Times Return Megatron's robot mode, Siege Astro Train's shuttle mode, Earthrise Double Dealer's everything, it's just something that has to happen. Something has to be sacrificed, even on third party figures. In fact, the smaller you go, especially on third party figures. Thrilling 30 Springer's copter mode definitely falls into this category. So obviously we can give it more of a break. Right? I mean, you can easily see it's a mess. It's always going to be a mess, considering it's the one that's sacrificed the most. The sides of the helicopter are an absolute joke, with an exposed hollow pass near the cockpit and side modules that make no sense whatsoever. They've made no effort at all to make this stuff even the slightest bit cohesive. It's literally just a bunch of folded up panels with hollowness so big you'd think they're dedicated cup holders. Also, hello visible hands, how you doing today? Staying hydrated? No locking tabs on the side of the torso either, because that makes sense, and you still have to deal with the wibbly shoulder panel 
panels. The back section is also pretty messy. Sure, there's a general idea here, but the seat panel refuses to lock in due to the tab being too wide to fit into the slot. The stabilizers are formed from the spoiler, which means still no tabbing in, and come on, these are clearly just legs. It's pretty f obvious. Even the windows look kind of underdone with clear plastic that doesn't really pop all that well and somewhat poorly defined side panels, so you can't really tell where the window starts and ends. It's messy as f and there's no denying it. That said, if I'm willing to give these two a pass, then I have to offer the same leeway to this. Well, actually, it's a lot more leeway, but the point still stands. And hey, the clear colour layout goes a long way to drawing your eye away from the somewhat scraggly areas. And beyond that, he probably has some of the best weapon storage I've seen on any copter former. Not in the sense that these are his swords, because that's a fairly common technique, but rather in the way it transforms. It's a hella cool conversion. Well, aside from some of the oddities in the robot mode, but that'll come into play later. Even the gun gets in on the action using a dedicated locking mechanism, and it lines up with the landing gear perfectly to boot. With the gun in place, it does look quite nice, messiness aside. So yes, it's not a great helicopter mode, but again, you have to temper your criticism considering the nature of triple changes. But even after doing so, what are you left with? Give leeway to Times Return Sentinel Prime's train mode, and you're left with a slick shuttle mode and a killer robot mode. Give leeway to Universe Octane's robot mode, and you've still got two fantastic deluxe-sized vehicle modes. Give leeway to Springer over here, and you're left with a wonky car mode, an unfinished transformation, and a robot mode that, well, we'll get to that in a second. I can go easier on those other figures because they're giving more outside their flaws, whereas Springer, well, is not rolling with the punches as much. And that becomes especially apparent when Siege Springer delivers an immensely solid helicopter, both aesthetically and engineering-wise. Now, to be fair, he is playing on easy mode. The differences between the two modes are much smaller. The body mass doesn't go through as much of a metamorphosis. You're still roughly dealing with the legs mushed together at the back and the arms chilling on the side, just slightly further back. I can't say it offers a completely different aesthetic, but much like the car mode, it pulls it off exceptionally well once you get down to the details. The legs fold out multiple times to form a thinner and more aerodynamic tail fin, complete with a teeny tiny spike at the top. It's also about halfway between the size of the G1 toy and the G1 toon, and I think this works out for the better. I still prefer the thrilling 30 tail fin design though, or at least I would if they stayed in place and I had the missing piece. You also get blast effect compatibility at the back, which mind you also carries over to the car mode for utter hilarity. That pales in comparison to the compatibility on the rotors though. If you have multiple lionizers or at least multiples of his specific blast effects, you can add sort of a motion blur to these. The effect is absolutely wonderful, and despite the swords having a more conventional transformation, this compatibility easily outclasses anything on the Thrilling 30 toy. It's also stand compatible, but be careful, the stand ports are damn tight. Still, the effect is absolutely awesome, pushing the functionality well above his predecessor. Honestly, there's very little I can criticise overall. Yes, the wings are damn small, but they continue the awesome mechanical detail and bring back the downward angle motif that the rest shows. I would have liked them to lock in a bit better, but compared to barely anything staying in place on the Thrilling 30 toy, yeah, I think I'll take it. The only thing I really wish they'd added is 5mm ports on these things, because as it stands, these front ports look kinda dumb. Once again, this is a mode that seems like it's taking the easy route, but in actuality it's doing a lot of smart stuff under the hood. With that idea at play, sadly the Thrilling 30 version's issues become a lot less understandable. In the context of the other modes, and in the context of a newer version that pulls off the ideas with much more finesse, I find myself liking this mode less and less. Plus, looking at how they rectified a bunch of these issues on the Sandstorm version, yeah, I'm done making excuses for this thing. Hypothetically, the criticism shouldn't be too frustrating here, but in practice, this thing is yet another bad mode. Point goes to the Siege version, again, which kind of already topples the score in its favour. I mean, I can just drop a size comparison, and you can click away from this video now if you want, since categorically it's already won the majority of the points. But if you do that, you'll miss out on the video essay elements that tie this whole video together. So I guess you're stuck with me for one more transformation, and one more incoherent rambling about plastic feel and build quality. Now at this point, you've actually seen most of the craziness in the transformation. Transformations. Not all of it, but definitely most of it. A lot of the cool stuff happens between the two vehicle modes. They kind of just unfold, but there are still some surprises here and there. If we're talking about the more unique of the two robot transformations, probably Thrilling 30 Springer would take the cake here. Just because all of this unfinished bullshit finally makes sense. But we won't discuss that just yet. First off, we gotta remove this blasted sword. And it converts back into its sword mode. You wanna line this up so that one of these teeth is facing forward. Then you bring the cross guard down and it actually locks into place there. So that the blade doesn't spin around. And you bring the blades together, you got the teeth there and the slot there, and it all kind of clicks in place. Again, literally the best part of the Thrilling 30 transformation, which is kind of disappointing in the grand scheme of things. But ah oh, well, I've already gone over that, whatever. So you want to come to the back here, and you're supposed to untab it from there, but of course the tabs don't work. So you got a tab there, slot there, these go together. Hooray, at least one tab works on this damn thing. Straighten out the legs using the faux ratchets. Jeez, these ratchets are so, so satisfying. satisfying. Bring up the 
the landing gear to form knee spikes. Separate the legs and they kind of push into place with these weird hinge mechanisms on the side. They're supposed to use these kinds of things to just move in place and such, but it's really broken down over time and it's really annoying. You take these sections and move them forward and move the foot forwards and bring out the heel spur like so. Sadly, it doesn't really lock into place. That's a bit of a bummer. I really like the way the wheels lock into place though. Yes, they're already in their configuration because in the car mode they flip around anyway, but it's a really lovely design. Nick Roche, you've done a fantastic job. Bring these sections out on the double hinges, but not all the way. I noticed someone on Twitter was complaining about this getting stuck in there. So what you want to do is pull out the head first. It rotates all the way up. Then you bring the torso down into place and notice how the landing gear isn't there. Now you just need to do the whole thing. So when you're transforming it back into vehicle mode, you need to make sure the landing gear is out. If it's in there, it's just going to get stuck. Just thought it would be something important to bring out because apparently it's something people have a lot of problems with. Anywho, you've got slots in there and tabs in there and these things all lock together. Not super solidly. I wish the connection was a bit more solid, but that forms a lovely chest. Then the arms separate from these. Nice to have locking mechanisms for that. Wish there were other locking mechanisms for the rest of the vehicle mode. And then these sections are genuinely cool. You untab that and bring the whole thing down, open up the window section and rotate this around and also bring out the fists. Come on, out you get, out you get, there you go. Then close up the windows like so. And of course, if you haven't already from the car mode, this kind of fits into place. Again, sliding rails, hate them for whatever. The elbow transformation is genuinely good on this thing. Probably the second best part of the transformation next to the sword, but faux parts might have made things a bit more solid, so I kind of don't know about that. Anyway, as Mgo would say, second verse, same as the first. Don't need to do much with the backpack because the helicopter configuration is just right. What you want to do instead is bring these kinds of panels up. They're not locked in that well. They just kind of slide up, but they do actually lock into place at the top here. Wish there was a locking mechanism down here and not just up there, but whatever. And last but not least, you bring the shoulder flaps to the side. If you don't like them, you can just leave them down, but that is quintessentially the IDW design and it is awesome. Something I actually wish the Siege version would have, but oh well, we get what we get. So most of the cool aspects of this transformation, yeah, they're right here. They're not between the two vehicle modes. Kind of wish they were spread out across the whole thing and I would have gladly taken sacrifices to the robot mode for the sake of the other two modes, but they had their priorities. This was the priority and I guess it gets the job done. We have what we have. The past can't be rewritten, but it can be learned from with a new version. So the first thing you want to do is untab that and no real transformation for that. It just kind of separates and does its thing later. And of course you also get rid of the guns if they're pegged on there. I can't believe I forgot about them when I was writing the script. Jeez, I'm an idiot. And here we go. So the first part of this main section is you want to untab everything here. We'll just leave it out to the sides temporarily. We'll transform them later on. Come to the back and bring up the backpack piece. That will give you enough clearance to bring down the leg sections. Speaking of, you separate them, come to the other side and bring the hips back into place. Come to the back section and rotate in the spoiler slash stabilizer section. I always forget this for the car mode. I remember for the helicopter mode quite a bit, but I always forget that they're supposed to be the spoiler pieces and they really make the car look cool. I guess I'm an idiot again. Anywho, these just rotate into the legs like so, and then these clip into the sides like so, and the feet rotate around into place like so. But you'll notice, hang on, the ankle tilts backwards. That's kind of weird. Well, that's because you need to come around to the front and rotate the thighs around like so. Now the torso, I'll admit, is a little tricky. You kind of get a feel for it eventually, but there's no real secret. It's just trial and error and eventually you get there. You come and just yank it out. You've got a double faux ratcheted hinge that kind of just comes up like so. And you push this front section down, which allows you to untab that. That's one section I didn't wish was tabbed in because that would make things a lot easier. But anyways, you start bringing that down, not all the way, but just enough. You then realize these fold in and that'll all peg together. And then after that, you can start bringing that down, but not all the way into place. It's not gonna lock in there yet because you need to bring the arms here. You'll notice there's two tabs there and they correspond with these two slots on the side and they also peg into the sides of the chest there. Because of the double hinge, getting them into place is not easy. There's no real trick to it again. It's just kind of like there, I guess. Yes, it works, hooray. Anywho, to unlock the arms, what you want to do is rotate the wings backwards like so. Unlock the arms from the five millimeter pegs at the back there. That will allow you to bring the shoulder modules up. You push in the wings again and rotate them around the whole section like so. Again, it's sliding rails, but I feel this one works all right. Come to the back, you bring in these sections and rotate them around. And no, they don't lock into place yet, but when these do lock into place nice and solidly, they just kind of sit there. Even even if they're not fully 
they're locked in, there's no way they're falling out, which is a wonderful way to clean things up. But if you prefer the more traditional method, you can kind of just leave them like that. Doesn't look great, but I know people prefer the shoulder stacks like so, but the official transformation is that. And last but not least, you take the double hinged backpack and it sort of sits there. It doesn't really lock in per se, but there are kind of tabs that don't slot into anything, but they do sit alongside the cockpit module, so it does stay in place mostly. Not ideal, but still pretty good. So there's not a lot of surprising stuff, definitely far less surprising stuff than the Thrilling 30 version, but there are definitely a lot of recontextualized steps from the conversion between the two vehicle modes. And you know what? That's fine. It doesn't really need to do anything different. Now, for going for which of the two is better, well, that's a tough one. This one definitely does more clever stuff, but it's at the cost of the other two modes. This one plays it safe in this instance, but between the two modes, there's a lot of clever stuff. At the end of the day, I still think I have to give it to the Siege version, just based on concept. It's not sacrificing everything for itself, yet it still holds its own against the Thrilling 30 version. And why are you going out of focus? Stop it. My point is, this does everything it does at the cost of the car mode, at the cost of the helicopter mode, at the cost of the transformation between the two. Whereas the Thrilling 30 version does just as good, if not better, in a few places, and the other modes aren't sacrificed. So in the context of everything that has come before, another point to the Siege version. It's just been a knockout at this point, and I'm really disappointed. I prefer the design here. I want this to be the better of the two. I am biased as f but I just can't help but notice this is doing the better job here. But hey, a bunch of people think the robot mode is the only thing that matters, so I guess we'll tackle that. Tally-ho, people. Tally-ho. For a lot of people, the first two thirds of this video are pretty much irrelevant. Neither of the other two modes of either figure matter, because the toy in question is going to remain in robot mode on a shelf as the representation of a character. So, despite being very one-sided in the matchup so far, for some people, the versus review could still go either way. I'm definitely not one of those people, but I can see where they're coming from. So, going in the same order, how does the Thrilling 30 edition fare? Well, pretty decently, if I'm being honest. Instead of sacrificing one mode for the sake of two, it seems as if they've sacrificed two for the sake of one. And as a result, this is a spot-on robot mode. Whether you're massively into the source material or not, this is one crazy awesome package. The head sculpt is one of the best I've seen on a Transformer, period, official or otherwise. It carries so much personality with its crisp paint, immaculate sculpt, and spot-on proportions. You can instantly tell what this guy's about from a cursory whoa, whoa, whoa. glance. It also sits atop a truly awe-inspiring torso design. The way the yellow pieces clip together is ingenious, and the midriff below pushes a surprising amount of detail, too. Unfortunately, from the top you have to deal with a bit of hollowness and exposed hinges. But given the time frame, this is par for the course. Thrilling 30 release right off the coattails of Fall of Cybertron, aka the point where the huge third-party exodus occurred because quality plummeted due to massive budget cuts. A bunch of Thrilling 30 figures suffered from similar shortcomings. Just take a look at Skybind, for instance. I think those budget cuts definitely affected the other modes slightly more, but as far as the robot mode is concerned, it's something that can be easily ignored. Still better than the Jetfire mold, anyway. The arms are pretty well designed, too. No small feat when you've got to deal with these kibble panels with obvious gaps from the front. You never notice it, though, nor do you notice the immense amount of panels on the forearms. It's a really clever way to fold everything up, and at least in this mode, every everything holds together rock solid. I reckon maybe using faux pass to keep the other modes more solid might have been a better idea, but I recognize the ambition and tip my hat to it. The legs are pretty neat too, or at least looks-wise. The wheel mass usage, a detail ripped straight from the comics, works really well here. And the way the landing gear becomes the knee spikes is really clever. It also has some rather neat hardware on show, with lovely clickety ratchets at the knees. In fact, overall, the articulation is pretty good for the time. Sure, no ankle tilts, but considering this came out well before the War for Cybertron trilogy, that kind of articulation hadn't become standardized yet. So what we have here is really commendable as is. Yes, the ratchets in general are probably faux, but they still feel good after all these years. Massive kudos, I say. Unfortunately, taking it back to the legs for a second here, not everything works that great. Once again, you have to deal with these annoying as f spoiler pieces flopping around as loose as Earthrise's definition of a wide release. It's not as annoying here as it is with the other modes, but still, come on. It would have been such a simple fix, even considering the budget. Secondly, due to the transformation, you've got these weird hinge systems that really don't like to stay in place. I've got to ask, why do things this way? Why not just make a traditional hinge here, it's really confusing. But the biggest gripe I have is stability. These heels are absolutely pitiful. Standing in a stock pose is fine, but try to do anything dynamic and you'll really have problems. And yes, in some instances you can use the spoilers to act as extra heel supports, but they only work 10% of the time. The joints just aren't solid enough to keep the joints upright. I suppose display-oriented collectors should be able to work around it, but if you're trying to mess with him for funsies, leaving him on the table for even half a second just ain't gonna work. And whilst on the topic of issues, what the hell is up with his cross guard? Why is it facing forward? Am I the only one who's bothered by this? It always bugs me quite a bit, and I never see anyone talking about it. Well, just me. 
Uh, okay, at least his gun is pretty sweet. It's one of the few guns with friction-based missiles that actually looks good, to the point where it looks better with them attached. This is a real rarity, mind you. You can also combine the weapons using the bottom port to create a pretty neat bayonet combo, or over the top to create stupid. It needs compatibility, and it complements the design quite well. I just wish those feet were better, as this is a design that feels like it would be right at home in dynamic poses. Unfortunately, without a figure stand, you're just not going to get that. And considering plenty of Transformers in the same line can pull off dynamic poses without one, I just can't let it slide. So I suppose that leaves us with our British friend. Well, first off, I want to address an argument that's probably going to come up in the comments. With the other two modes, they could be compared much more closely due to basic design choices that apply to every alt mode on the planet. But in robot mode, the aesthetics pretty quickly come into their own. Surprisingly, most people instantly claim that the Thrilling 30 version looks better from a supposed objective standpoint. Yes, even G1 fans, surprisingly. And I've got to say, I don't think either of these is better looks-wise. Both are going for completely different designs, one in the Nick Roche flavor, one in the Tonk one. As far as aesthetics go, both of these do exceptionally well, and I don't think this is the way to properly compare the two, at least as far as the robot mode is concerned. You can kind of do it with the vehicle modes, but definitely not here. What you can do is examine articulation, build quality, and how well it executes the aesthetic it goes for. For the last of those three, I think the two are evenly matched. Seed Springer expertly brings his G1 design into the modern era with a hefty dose of mechanical detail and, same as the other two alternate modes, extremely high quality paintwork. The head sculpt is spot on sculpt wise. It doesn't carry the same expressiveness of the Siege <coughs> version, and the yellow is a little worse, but it does the job exceptionally well regardless. Besides, what he lacks in the face sculpt, he makes up for in the chest solidity. No scraggy hinges here, old chap, just nice chunkachoo. That heft continues to the rest of his proportions. He's really embraced the G1 brick star, but with a modern flair that honestly gives me quite the Unicron trilogy vibe. And mate, I absolutely love the arms with how the shoulder pieces fold into place seamlessly and the wheels curl up in a manner just as clever as the Thrilling 30 ones. Plus, they're so poseable too, with free motion in so many directions. Hell, the posability is pretty great all round. Although I suppose that's to be expected given the standardized articulation of the War for Cybertron trilogy. Sure, the waist doesn't go all the way, but you can get pretty much all you'd want. Besides, the Thrilling 31 was also pretty limited, provided you didn't remove the back panel. If this figure didn't have this posing, he'd probably be a boring brick, practically disqualifying him from this matchup. But thanks to the posing power, he's given just as much life as his predecessor. And can I say that the battle damage really helps bring this war-torn aesthetic to life. Now that it's evenly spread across the chest, shoulders, and shins, I think it finally reaches its full potential. Sorry if you guys aren't a fan, but I really think this does well. So aesthetics-wise, I think these things are both fantastic. Not really a contest here. However, there's one point where the matchup finally reaches its climax, and of course, it's the tolerances. The Siege version. Yes, yeah, surprisingly, it's S38's turn to have f joints because the feet are even worse. I massively commend them for pushing as much articulation as possible into these things. But when they're this bloody loose, standing this guy in any pose is a pain in the ass. Yes, even directly straight up. It's really f annoying, and I wish there was a way to fix it. Hang on a minute. Cybertron S38 Springer constantly falling over like a drunken taxidermist on a Thursday morning. Well, I think I may have a solution for you, old chum. You will need a joint tightening solution for this. Personally, I use superglue, the brush type, for ease of application. But if you find other solutions like floor or nail polish to work better, feel free to use either of these. What you want to do is pull open the ankle tilts like so, 90 degrees, and no more. Then rotate the foot out to this angle. The reason you want to do this is to expose the part of the plastic that rubs up against the foot when transformed into robot mode. This is where you want to apply a very small amount of tightening solution. Only apply a small amount. As if you add too much, you risk locking up the joint entirely. I did this with my copy of Time to Turn Croc, and it took two weeks to repair. Fellas, it ain't worth it. Now, if you muck it up and apply too much glue when it goes in the joint, don't worry. Just make sure to rotate the joints every 20 minutes for the first couple of hours. This will ensure they do not lock up fully. Make sure you use a small brush to apply to avoid this happening. This is why I personally prefer these super glue bottles over floor and nail polish. They come with the brush pre-installed. Now from here, do the same to the other side and wait 24 hours with the legs facing upwards so the glue may dry properly. Keep the backpack down so the toy sits easier on the table. Once it's done, hey pronto! You've now got a much sturdier springer. Jolly good show. Now I'd better get back to that taxidermist. My baby maker isn't going to stop herself now, is she? Now I'm aware you shouldn't have to fix your toys to get basic functionality. Joints like this should work out of the box. However, here's the thing. You can at least fix this. With a Thrilling 30 version, the ankles are far too small, meaning it's a permanent issue. Same with the leg tab. With the Siege version, these tend to come undone whenever you try to move the knees. Again though, you can thicken these with super glue to stay in place better. With the weird leg hinges on the Thrilling 30 version, once those locking mechanisms break down, that's it. Wobble City. Get f 
sucks, I suppose. Plus, beyond that, once again, the Siege version just has better plastic quality. Despite the fact he's shorter and stockier, he feels denser, even though he has roughly the same plastic on show. The Thrilling 31, comparatively, feels lightweight. The only thing that the Thrilling 30 version really does better, outside of the head sculpt, is the backpack. The Siege one really doesn't like to tab in. It'll remain in place due to the tab tolerances on the side, which means, thankfully, it's not relying on the hinges alone. But this is still annoying. But aside from that, it's either the same level of quality between the two, or a staggering improvement for the Siege version. I mean, I guess you can make the argument that the weapons are cooler on the Thrilling 30 version, but Siege makes up for it with more of them. Clocking in at four and a half, between this and the combat system ports, you get a lot of options. When I started writing this script, I planned a very different thesis. Thrilling 30 Springer is a very nostalgic toy for me. Sure, I only got him about six years ago, but he started my return to the franchise after a long hiatus. I really wanted to be wrong in my original video. I wanted to renounce my old ways, but instead, through this careful examination, I think I've only strengthened my original thoughts. It's not that my argument was bad, it's just that my presentation was garbage. This mold has a lot of love due to the source material. It came out at a time where IDW was at its peak, before Hasbro started to interfere. It gave people what they had been asking for, and that is pretty commendable. But at the end of the day, it's just okay. We've got one truly decent mode, one that looks great but has terrible tolerances, and one that's just... No! I want to be less harsh on him, but I keep looking at Sandstorm and seeing all the improvements they've made there. When I first messed with Sandstorm, I remember being turned off by the plastic quality, but given all Transformers would eventually stoop to that level for the Prime Wars trilogy, maybe I was too harsh. If they were willing to fix a lot of the mold's problems for that release, it goes to show there were issues being considered even at the time. What this figure does is commendable, sure, but take a closer look and the facade of hype falls down. Shoddy build quality and abysmal tolerances plague every corner. He still looks fantastic in robot mode, no doubt, but as a toy, there's a lot they could have done better. Conversely, Siege Springer may seem boring at first. In fact, when I first received him, I didn't pay him much attention. He was just another G1 brick after all, more so than anything Siege had released prior. What was there to get excited about? Well, if you take a closer look, surprisingly a lot. The engineering is clever and classy, the paintwork is stunning, and here's the thing, there's not a single mode that has been sacrificed. Sure, it's likely due to the lack of differences between the car and copter modes, but even so, I can't think of a single other triple changer that does this. The only thing really holding this back from an absolute 5 out of 5 is the tolerances in the legs. Once you fix those, you've basically got the best triple changer Haztac has ever done, bar none. Look, I'm a biased mother I massively prefer the IDW aesthetic to that of G1. These designs have always looked more dynamic to me, despite my limited knowledge about the stories behind them. Even so, I still don't find that much to enjoy in the Thrilling 30 version anymore. The quality in the Siege version is so undeniable that it's overriding my own personal biases. That's how you know it's a quality figure. This script didn't turn out the way I expected it to. I had this whole spiel about how it was amazing that we got two fantastic versions of Springer back to back, something even members of my Discord server have pointed out. Thing is though, did we really? Was Thrilling 30 ever that amazing to begin with? As I grow older, I open myself up to new experiences. I see the value in aesthetics I was never too keen on, and I realize that maybe things I liked weren't as good as I thought back in the day. But with Springer, my opinion hasn't changed, but rather matured. I understand why I feel the way I do more clearly, and I'm able to articulate it far better. I understand that things don't work because of budget, and that things still don't work in spite of that. I also see passion in areas I never would have expected. If you're buying one of these because you like the look of it better, that's perfectly valid. But from my own perspective, I don't think you'll find a better Springer than the Siege version. Turns out, while 2016 Dr. Lockdown may have been a dumb f he was actually right about one thing. And it's definitely not his feelings about Titans Return Sentinel Prime. I can say no such slander on this man! It was a fellow, you twisted f